you. I'd like to welcome Vanessa uh, Tooley. She has her own business called Here. She did a home care in uh, Phoenix. She trains her staff and provide care to families across the Navajo and Gila River Nations. And, and she was also instrumental in um, the Navajo Hopi COVID relief efforts during the pandemic. And without further ado, I'm going to turn this time over to you, uh, Vanessa. Yeah, uh, everyone, thank you for joining me. I'm actually um, presenting from uh, the Arizona College of Law. Today is the um, Indian Law Program's luncheon and also graduation later. So um, I, I had to make arrangements to um, do a presentation offsite. Normally I, I host uh, presentations from my office. Um, so I wanna thank you all for bearing with us for this late start. Um, I did compile a presentation to share with you all. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get that started here. Welcome to today's session. My name is Vanessa Tooley. Uh, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I have six daughters and I opened up my business in, I, I started the whole process in July of 2018. And um, I have been running my business uh, since then and have had a few staff members join me along the way and I'm, I'm very excited to be here and share my story and uh, hopefully empower you all to um, encourage to step outside of your roles that you currently have and work more in developing and nurturing your communities. Now, uh, my presentation will cover the beginning of my small business, um, our response to COVID-19, assisting with the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund, and then also what the future holds. Now, like most of you, I started my business out of necessity. Um, I, I am the oldest of four children and I grew up in a single parent household. And um, in 2017, it was in May of that year that we discovered my mom had stage four cancer. And she had always received her care at IHS. And, um, you know, they would tell her occasionally her lab work was abnormal they would change her medications and they always thought it might be due to, um, you know, her, her diabetes condition. And once we found out it was cancer, um, it was too late to implement any type of treatment. You know, radiation therapy was out of the question. Chemotherapy was out of the question. And I felt, you know, completely disappointed and let down by the, the doctors and the care providers from the IHS facility that she usually went to. Um, so, you know, we asked what was next and they said, well, um, you know, it's probably time that you start planning for her end of life care. And this involved moving her into a home that she could possibly be mobile in, um, you know, with her, cancer condition her there was a lot of liquid that built up in her stomach and it was difficult for her to move around sometimes it was hard for her to breathe and um you know I just felt like she needed someone there to help take care of her and help um guide you know the symptoms that we should look out for and when it was necessary to call 911 do we even call 911 um and those were questions that I needed answered. And I started looking for home care agencies and then also training facilities that I can learn and hopefully participate in some training um, to become a caregiver. And a lot of these organizations turned me away and they were basically telling me, 
you know, if my mother was on the long-term care program or if she was approved for hours, they'd be willing to train me and hire me to take care of her. And I thought that was ridiculous. You know, I wasn't wanting to do this for money. I just wanted some general guidance. And um, the, the last contact I made was with the Hospice of the Valley and they were able to come out and have a nurse check on us consistently and that was really helpful the, they gave us a booklet of information that we needed to be aware of and then they also prepared us for you know what, what would happen when my mom actually left left this earth so that was wonderful to have that great support um so my mom passed away and um I was approached by a business owner that owned a non-emergency medical transportation company and he wanted to start home care. And so upon my search for home care agencies, I ended up um, finding a good deal of information on the access website and how to become a provider. So I told them, you know, I think if I spent some more time researching, I can definitely build your company. So he hired me. I did all that research and built his company in a matter of months. And then um, working with him, uh, he, he wasn't Native American, he wasn't from the US and uh, I just saw him taking advantage of our people. You know, a lot of the NEMT drivers are from Navajo Nation and they're instructed to go out there and hustle for their own clients, pay for their own gas. And, um, you know, if there's long trips, you're not allowed to spend the night. You, you might have to drive back home and so forth. So I thought that was very unfair. Um, I ended up leaving his company after being with him for maybe, I think, six months. And uh, that's when I had started the paperwork for my home care agency and I was approved by access to be a provider. So that's when I started to um, develop relationships with patients that needed caregivers and then, you know, seek out those caregivers. And that's how I started my business. So Ahia Home Care was created to provide competitive wages, benefits, and training the caregivers who need the support. And I personally believe that our elders deserve every opportunity to enjoy their retirement in their home surrounded by family. And that's why home care is so important. So goals for expanding my small business. So I was in business for almost two years when I decided that I needed to stop working out of my vehicle and stop working out of my home. Um, at the time when I started my company, I had a one-year-old and um, I, I felt like I needed more space and more time to develop the marketing for my company. Um, I knew with the growing clients that we were getting that I was also going to need assistance in the office and um, I needed formal structure for housing all the, the data and information that I had. Um, so I found an office space here in Phoenix. I did search across Navajo and I went to, um, you know, the shopping center and I definitely tried my hardest to get an office space out there, even using, you know, a storefront space and, you know, the, the price of doing that along with the cost of getting internet out there. And then, you know, of course, where was I going to live? Um, all that just did not work out or fall into place. And then, of course, my biggest concern was child care. Um, I, I couldn't find anyone, you know, to assist and help with, with meeting those needs that I had for my family and my business. So, I um, signed the lease at the beginning of 2020 and uh, my partner and I, my companion, he and I um, did a whole lot of uh, 
demo and construction to the office space because when we received the space, it was just bare bones. Um, we did painting and decorating and I made it my second home. And um, I'm very proud of the work that we did. And I was very excited, you know, to have all this space. And, and uh, every day I went to the office, I went with the intention that that space was going to be used for good work. And at the opening of our office, we had a prayer done. And um, that was the main part of the prayer, you know, establishing that value that that office space that I had would be used for good work. And, you know, no matter what happened with my home care agency, I would always be able to help others. And, um, you know, one of the, the main teachings that I had as a child growing up uh, from my Masana was that we're all five fingered beings. Can't is not in our vocabulary. Um, so everything that we are given in our lifetime is, you know, situations that we can overcome. It might not be easy. It might be very difficult for us, but we cannot say we can't. We can't overcome it. You know, these obstacles. So with that teaching instilled in me, um, I was very strong headed <laughs> and I, I pushed forward and opened my office. And in the meantime, I had my eyes on the news and uh, I was reading a lot of um, bulletins and uh, posts on Reddit. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Reddit and um, you know, I, I started getting concerned about the COVID-19 um, illness that was going across China and, you know, seeing people waiting in lines at the hospital and then just, you know, collapsing because they were extremely ill and they had no real explanation for what was happening other than it was more like a... Um, common cold but for some reason people were unable to fight it and it was something new and you know there was a lot of unknowns about it so um one of the main things that we learned is that it was extremely contagious and people were instructed you know stay away from each other and of course China handled it um very strongly by enforcing lockdowns and with their tight-knit communities, um, you know, I saw a lot of footage where these massive apartment buildings were just, um, people were stuck in their apartments. And then, you know, their only form of communication was either online, which was very limited. And then also they would open their windows and they would, you know, yell, to each other or even sing songs together. And I was thinking, you know, like, oh my gosh, if that happens here in the US, what will what will happen to us? You know, like how how badly will they enforce a lockdown? And then of course, what's gonna happen with Navajo Nation? And um, so I, I noticed that Ethel Branch had posted on Facebook and um, she was concerned as well. And in the meantime, I was uh, making sure that I was getting supplies out to the families that I worked with. Um, usually every quarter, I'll provide some basic care items to them. Um, you know, some of them would request items like some diabetic lotion or, um, you know, just some over-the-counter remedies that they weren't able to find. And uh, of course, during flu season, I was giving them face masks and hand sanitizer. And then of course, soaps, disinfectants, all those things were being provided to them. And then of course, gloves, you know, a lot of our caregivers um, help with the, our elders with, you know, uh, toileting or incontinence issues. So I made sure to provide gloves. So I was getting out care packages to my staff across Navajo and Gila River. And I was instructing them, you know, we've got to keep our distance. Make sure you don't allow anyone into your home. 
And if you're going to communicate with anyone, you make sure that they keep a really good distance away from you. Um, you know, we can't hug, we can't embrace each other, we can't shake hands. And then, um, you know, I, I, I learned at that time that the community health representatives were also doing visits and, and passing out some uh, instructions that were along the same guidelines. So I felt like, you know, I was helping reinforce that messaging and encouraging my staff to take care of each other and be cautious. So um, I just explained this, I should have changed the slide earlier. After I've taken care of my patients and their families, I thought about what about the rest of our elders? Um, you know, I, I myself went out to get groceries for my grandfather. We were in Window Rock and we went to the bashes there and I could see, you know, there was no toilet paper, there was no paper items. And, um, you know, any of the meats that we were looking at buying him were all the expensive cuts. And he was okay with that. He, he got some T-bone steaks because I couldn't really find him any other type of meat to, to hold him over. Um, you know, even stuff like bologna, that, that was all out of stock. And so I told him, you know, I'll do some shopping for him here in Phoenix and then I'll, I'll take him up some more groceries. And, you know, he was, he was okay with that. He, he felt confident that I'd be able to deliver to him. And um, so Ethel, on one of her posts on Facebook, she decided, you know, this is getting really serious. Um, I think they just announced the first case in Washington state and it hit a, um, a nursing home. And um, she decided to establish the GoFundMe, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund was formed at that point on March 15, 2020. And that day we connected and we, we spoke on the phone and she asked, you know, like, what are you capable of providing? And I told her, you know, well, I, I shop all the time. Um, you know, I have memberships at the big box stores. Um, it's just a matter of finding what we need. I know there's a toilet paper shortage, but we can reach out to some janitorial suppliers. And, you know, um, this was when I had helped find some solutions to, you know, um, shortages we were facing. And that first day of GoFundMe, um, we raised $5,000. So the whole time I was out there shopping, we kept checking in with each other. And she was like, you know, what's the total on your receipts right now? And I said, well, you know, the first shopping trip, I was able to get these few items. Um, and I'm not sure how much you want me to spend. She was like, clear those shelves, get whatever you can. We just raised five thousand dollars, and so that's when I got my newly hired office staff on board. Um, my partner, I had pulled him away from work, <laughs> and we all started loading up our personal vehicles, and we would just get loads and loads of food and haul it over to my house. And um, I also had to purchase a refrigerator. Um, I had a good friend, Corinda McLean, here in the Valley. Um, she works with the, one of the elementary school districts um, in the cafeteria. And she also does concert events where she does the catering. So she was telling me about a few um, bulk locations that we can shop from. So we went to those places and we were purchasing uh, lamb we were purchasing green chili, we were getting flour and, you know, so much good items that, you know, we're going off the shelves in other locations. So she definitely helped out in a big way. And then um, by March 17th, uh, we had Dolores Gray Eyes come to my house and pick up 
everything that I had purchased, um, even the over-the-counter cold remedies. Um, I bought the last bit of hand sanitizer that I could find. And um, she was able to make that delivery to Chilchimbatol um, just as the first case was identified on Navajo Nation. So um, we were in action long before um, Navajo Nation was. And I think that was, you know, something pretty amazing. You know, just a group of us, I think um, the, the beginning calls, there was about 12 or 14 of us that were on the calls. And we were all discussing, you know, okay, well, now that we're generating, you know, this interest and people are donating to the relief fund, we've got to find bigger solutions and that way we can help everyone. So we started an online form in which um, folks could sign up online and, um, in the beginning stages, I felt like we had to operate covertly. Um, Ethel had wanted to work with the Navajo Nation to build the, the pandemic, um, the relief effort. And they, um, you know, weren't responsive. So I had talked to my uncle, Earl Tooley, and he said, Ta Ajit Ego is not a crime. And that means it's up to you in Navajo, you know. And the way I understood it, and him speaking to me like that, is that, you know, I need to continue because this is, you know, the good work that I'm interested in doing. And um, he was, he was ready to do some secret distributions and just get out there and drive out overnight and make deliveries to, to households that he knew that needed the help. Um, but we were encouraging folks to stay home for two weeks. And with the amount of food that we were providing each household, I think it was more than enough. And it was high quality. Um, we made sure that the food that we were providing was definitely well-balanced and healthy. Um, so in my personal capacity, I had to step out of my comfort zone and rise to the challenge of, you know, helping more people and finding solutions in order to do that. Um, so shopping, in public was getting too dangerous. Um, you know, at this point we were learning that the best form of protection was wearing a face mask. So um, I had went on to um, reach out to grocery stores and their parent companies or where they get their, their food from, the distributors that they worked with. And um, my sister was a pastry chef and her restaurant is in Mesa and she was concerned, you know, business is slowing down, people are starting to quarantine. Um, you know, you might want to contact uh, some of the distributors we work with and, um, you know, they might have some ability to make those deliveries to you. And I was thinking, you know, yeah, okay, um, give me some numbers and I'll give the, the sales rep a call. So I called Shamrock. And I struck gold. Uh, I, ex I explained to the sales representative, you know, I'm working with this organization. We're raising a lot of money and we need to get food out there quickly. And um, I also need to set up some distribution sites. How can we set up an account? And he said, has your organization been in operation for two years or more and I said no we just started you know within a few weeks uh, and so he was like well you know um, I see that you, you have your own business can you use your business to start the account and I said you know I'll ask the team if they're okay with that but I'm, I'm positive that I can start the account 
And so um, I spoke with the team about it and everyone was okay. And then we made payment arrangements through our fiscal sponsor. So the funds were coming directly from the GoFundMe money. And um, I was able to convince the transportation team to deliver to any of our distribution sites as long as they were located and accessible by pavement. Um, so that worked out really well. And I needed to see firsthand, you know, how much food I was ordering because I had no idea what a 50 pound bag of potatoes looked like. You know, usually for my household, a 10 pound bag lasts about a week. And, um, you know, I'm thinking for a household of four, maybe a five pound bag might be better. Uh, so, you know, we were having to repack some of the bulk items that we were, we were receiving and luckily they were able to provide some extra packing supplies and they even started to um, uh, find vendors that were providing them with vitamins, um, toilet paper, they got us toilet paper, it's not the big commercial size ones, but we were getting the smaller household, household size rolls. And uh, Shamrock really assisted us in getting the items in the right sizes that we needed. Um, but in the beginning, it was pretty rough having our distribution teams, you know, repack those items. So now that I wasn't out there shopping and I was able to just go through the online catalog and process these orders, I also started reaching out to um, you know, several communities. I started with the chapter house. I started with the schools and then, um, you know, volunteers that were reaching out, you know, I asked them if they were able to find a church or a location that we can use. I had to ask them questions about their storage capabilities. You know, do they have enough refrigerator space? Are they able to get, you know, people to donate the refrigerators for this distribution and a distribution would take about four days. So um, I would get these teams together and then we, we had um, our training developed, Ethel had some volunteers develop the training for the general health and safety protocols and then also distribution protocols. Everything was supposed to be no contact and then of course, um, you know, our sites were supposed to be sterile. Everyone needed to, to be aware that, you know, if they were in and out of the buildings, they were gonna either wear, you know, one of the Tyvek suits or um, clean clothing and change if they were going in and out of the building. So we had a lot of um, instruction and rules for them in place to protect them. And then of course, protect the folks that we were serving. So it was a really organized and um, professional way of delivering food boxes, I think. Um, of course, you know, when word got out that we were doing distributions, there might be, you know, extended lines of vehicles from for, for miles for people waiting to get some food. And, um, you know, one of our distribution sites in Chinle was actually able to receive multiple deliveries a week. So this is uh, one of the first trainings I hosted with the Pinyon School uh, Unified School District. And um, the team lead there was Jonathan Allen. And he was, very helpful in getting, um, you know, the superintendent and the school board to participate with the food distributions. And uh, we were able to use our cafeteria, which is beautiful. Um, you know, they had plenty of storage and then the staff there, they were all dedicated to making sure that everything was sanitized and you know it was just beautiful and organic how all our work came together and um, you can see some volunteers here that are reportioning or rinsing the vegetables um, and we would let them dry and then we would pack them in uh, ziploc baggies so it, it took a lot of preparation to get the food boxes ready and as i mentioned before we were making sure that we we're providing well-balanced food boxes. 
Um, when I did the orders, I made sure to get some breakfast items, you know, eggs, bacon, cream of wheat, or some type of cereal like oatmeal um, and milk, of course, butter, and some meats. We were providing chicken and ground beef, a lot of chicken and ground beef. Um, I was also hoping to get Bluebird uh, to work with us on providing, um, you know, big bags of flour and they, they weren't able to, they said, you know, they can work directly with Shamrock. So, um, a Shamrock would contact me, you know, every week, how many orders of bluebird flour do you need for, you know, the next two weeks? And I'd give him an estimate and he'd get those in stock for us. And, um, you know, they were, it was just really neat how everything came together. And, um, but this is what one of our boxes will look like. And as you can see um, on the floor next to her, there's a second box of melons and more food. I think there is bread in there and um, squash and some more vegetables. So uh, they, they were <clears throat> pretty great food boxes. I was really proud of getting those assembled for our receivers um, or the folks that we were serving. Um, so once we, we had the food distributions in place and we were on a roll with those, um, we were able to find some suppliers that provided hand sanitizers, face masks. Um, we started developing our own um, materials on COVID-19, you know, the precautions that you should take. Um, the, the one pager that is included here in this PPE bag is um, showing folks how to use hand sanitizer correctly. And it was translated into Navajo. So there's English on one side, Navajo on the other. And one side was printed black and white so the kids could color it. Um, and it was just, you know, something that our team came up with to include and you know, we wanted to educate the public and and make sure you know they were aware of how to properly take care of themselves and uh, prevent COVID from spreading. Now this is uh, one of our trucks that we were able to purchase after we, we started receiving that influx of money. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, folks from Ireland were donating in a big way. And also um, we had a few celebrities that donated a lot of money. So we were able to put it to use. And um, my, my company actually hosted the toll-free number, the 833-956-1554 number. We still answer at that number. So if anyone has any inquiries about the relief effort, you can give us a call. Um, and if we don't answer, please leave us a message. Uh, right now I have limited staff at the office um, because of all these graduations that are going on. But yeah, that's another way that my company had helped. And uh, we also sewed face masks um, through the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund. My company sewed and delivered 1,700 face masks. And we also um, sent face mask for anyone that called in, you know, through the, the uh, toll free number and said they needed mask. We would just send them, you know, a couple of face masks and mail it straight to them directly. And uh, that's how I kept my office staff busy because, you know, at this point in time, I wasn't allowed to go and do home visits with my, my staff. And then uh, while we were continuing to deliver supplies to them, that was all no contact. So, um, you know, that's how we kept busy. And I, I had a lot of beautiful fabric that I was saving. I don't know what for. I just, you know, I'm a crafty lady. I like to sew. I like to knit, crochet. So, um, you know, I encourage my staff to take on these interests. And I probably drove them crazy, you know, with all these extra projects that we were doing to help with the relief effort. But I felt like, you know, we were we were in the right place at the right time to help. 
Now, um, currently we've, we've ended the um, direct relief isolation kits that we were um, delivering. And then also we, we ended the vaccine campaign. Um, we were encouraging folks to get vaccinated and providing incentives to them. Uh, it could have been a, a gift card, um, t-shirts, um, posters, and then of course we gave out some sun's tickets, and um, that was all made possible by Made to Save, which was a sponsor of that. And then um, currently, what we're doing right now, um, the the work continues. I am the board treasurer of Ye Hall Nido, which is the organization behind uh, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID nineteen relief fund. And I wanted to share our vision, our mission, and our goal with you all. Um, our vision is to empower our Navajo and Hopi people with the fortitude to overcome challenges through traditional principles of self-reliance and interrelatedness. Our mission is to build collective Navajo and Hopi power to exercise their inherent rights to self-determination by putting our cultural values and teachings into practice to rebuild and revitalize our communities. And then of course, our primary goal is to make our communities pandemic proof and climate change resilient. We never wanna be this vulnerable again. Thus, we have reserved some unrestricted funding to invest in a stronger future for our communities in the areas of food security, entrepreneurship, youth leadership, and housing. And uh, currently our first initiative to advance those long-term goals is the launch of community centers, which we opened the first one in Monument Valley last year. And then we're hoping to open one soon. I believe it's in um, Tahajale or Tahachi. I'm not sure which one. I'll have to confirm with the team. Um, and those community centers will infuse remote and underdeveloped communities with resources that will give them flight to the natural leadership and entrepreneurship in our communities and serve as innovation hubs at the local level. So if you're in the Monument Valley area, I encourage you to visit our community center and take advantage of that space. It is a real beautiful space. We have a library there, which you could check out books from. And we also have vendors um, that have some items um, set up there as well. And then also uh, we have a business um, area that you can use. We have printers, computers, and we also have some workshop areas where we're hosting um, sewing classes, beading classes, you know, just all those fun things that we as natives like to do. Um, and I think that inspires, you know, our cultural connections with each other and that, that eh, um, I think that's really important. And that's what I see for my office as well. Um, so, for my office, um, right now I am working on developing some patient advocacy workshops. You know, a lot of the time when our elders attend medical appointments or, um, you know, they have visits with the community health representatives or even their case managers. Um, you know, there are some things that are lost in translation. And uh, I think a lot of the time they don't know, you know, what questions are okay to ask. Um, if they go to the doctor and they get new prescriptions, they're not sure if they're supposed to finish the old prescriptions first before they continue the new prescriptions. So things like that can be tricky. Um, and also, you know, just checking in on your neighbors. I think that's very important for all of us to do. And, uh, you know, at the moment, um, you know, we've all been pretty isolated from each other and we're getting a little bit more comfortable with being out in public or attending large events. So um, when you're out there, you know, reconnecting, make sure that you grab your, your friend or your relatives or your neighbor's phone number and say, you know, hey, I'm going to 
check in on you at least once a month and make that commitment to them to make sure that they're doing okay because we just overcame you know uh, some of the biggest hurdles in our lives and um, you know a lot of us had suffered significant loss so um, you know we just need to be there for each other Another thing I would like to do is host free training sessions for caregivers. I think it's important for everyone over the age of 18 to learn how to be a caregiver. And uh, for my family, you know, my six, my six daughters, the oldest three are 17, 15, and 13. And they all have their food handlers permits they all have their first aid and CPR certifications. So, um, you know, that's basically the main requirement for caregiving. And of course, you, you take the, an eight hour long training class, um, which will provide you with more skills in, in working with your patient. But, um, you know, I think that's very important for everyone to have and be aware of. And then that way, you know, if someone in your household or even a relative needs assistance, you can be there for them. And, uh, you know, I think that should definitely be free. So I'm hoping to start hosting these training sessions and workshops um, over the course of the summer. I'm just waiting for my girls to wrap up their school year. Um, and right now I'm also working on providing caregiving to our veterans. Uh, this would mean getting a federal contract and I'm still researching into this, but, you know, sky's the limit. Um, I'm definitely capable of uh, growing and expanding in that way. Um, right now, there's not a lot of support from the VA for our veterans across the Navajo Nation. So I think that's something that's really important. And then not even just Navajo Nation, there's other tribal communities that struggle, you know, with, with meeting the federal government and, um, you know, applying for these big contracts. I think, you know, a lot of us can be intimidated by the language in these applications or, um, you know, even taking that step, you know, getting out of our comfort zone to pursue these bigger contracts. Um, so lastly, uh, this used to be a priority, but it's not so much right now, but I would like to provide comfortable and safe transportation options, especially wheelchair and stretcher transportation. Um, it's really expensive <laughs> to purchase these types of vehicles right now or have vehicles modified. Um, so I'm, I'm holding off on that until we can, um, grow and expand upon what I have set up already. But um, those are definitely, you know, things that I'd like to do. And of course, provide that training that includes, you know, uh, COVID-19 precautions. And then also not only that, but, you know, transporting patients with infectious diseases. And that requires, you know, dedicated training um, to offer those services and you would have to be certified in at different levels to get that type of certification. So um, those are things that I'm definitely working on, but that's where I see my company going. Um, currently I am hiring. My website is ahiaha.org and I am looking for an HR manager. I'm looking for a receptionist. I'm looking for someone that can help me with billing and timekeeping, and then also um, someone that can recruit because right now it's really difficult to recruit. Um, I, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's really, really difficult to find caregivers that want to work, especially here in the Valley. Um, so if you guys uh, know anyone that might be interested in helping me develop and grow my company, I'd definitely be interested in hearing from you and you can reach out to me through my website. Now, I wanted to open up um, for any questions that you might have. I, I hope this generated a lot of interest 
um, and how you can use your small business to, you know, help your community. So let me go ahead and stop sharing here. So hello, Zane and Romalita. Thank you for providing your contact information. And Geraldine asked, how can I get my elderly parents help with home living? Is there an income eligibility? Yes, there is. So I'll show you the website here. Let me go back to sharing real quick. So I'm going to go on the Access website. Geraldine, I'm assuming you're in Arizona. Um, it shouldn't be much different for uh, New Mexico, but I primarily help those with here in Arizona. So this is the application. So I'm at the access.gov website. So you want to make sure that you're there. Now this is um, instructions for how to apply for access. To be eligible, uh, your relatives need to be in need of a nursing home level of care. They must be a citizen or qualified immigrant, have a social security number, be an Arizona resident. They should apply for all cash benefits they might be entitled to, such as um, pensions, VA benefits, or even a social security disability. Um, they should live in a, an approved living arrangement, such as their own home, or they can live in an access certified nursing facility or assisted living facility. And uh, for single applicants, the resources cannot well, the income limit would be $2,000. If they are married, it should be um, double that, but they can set aside some of their resources for the need of the spouse. So you'll wanna ask for a community spouse information sheet to see how you know, the resources can be divided between a married um, elderly couple. They can always apply for a trust, so actually, so the gross monthly limit is $2,523. This form also answers a number of other questions and you can actually apply over the phone. If you're with your parents, you can give the long-term care program a call and their phone number is 888-621-6880. Uh, you can speak with someone in Navajo if you wanted to request, request that option. Access does have that available. Um, so, you know, I would encourage you to start the process. I know it takes about 90 days from start to finish to getting approved. Um, it's pretty extensive, especially if um, the case managers are looking at income and they want to a detailed, um, I guess, a detailed bank statement and stating, you know, why the, these funds are here and what they were used for and, you know, things like that. So you just want to be cautious with your, your, um, your family's bank accounts to make sure that they're not receiving a lot of money in their accounts. Um, so that's how you, you would apply. And I, I'm going to share the link in the chat. Interesting and it's inspiring. And, you know, I can also say that I started my home care agency because I don't necessarily have good faith in nursing homes. Um, you know, everyone that I knew that was in a nursing home during the course of the pandemic had passed away. Uh, my Nolly lady, my father-in-law, and my my uncle, and then of course uh, the Winslow Nursing Home was hit pretty pretty hard with COVID. So you know I think it's very instrumental that we keep our elders at home, and that you know we take it upon ourselves, and and accept that responsibility in providing care for them. So you know I know it's difficult to prioritize them in that way, but we definitely should provide them with that comfort. You know, they've done so much for us and you're lucky to have your grandparents um, if, they are, if they are still here. So does anyone else have any questions? I'm curious to know, we have currently 
five other participants. I'm wanting to know um, what your small business is and where you're located. So if you guys don't mind uh, unmuting yourselves, you can you can speak and we can share, you know, where you're from and what your small business is. Well, I want to thank you all for for your time. I I know my voice is. I hear it's very melodic and soothing, so I might have put some of them, some of our listeners to sleep, but I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, if no one wants to share what their business is, or maybe you're in the process of starting a business, um, I want to put a few things out there, and I mentioned this at the uh, Navajo Nation Economic Summit, but some of the businesses that I'm interested in seeing would be more RV uh, camping sites. Um, so my solution for not being able to get an office on Navajo Nation was to purchase a camper trailer. And, um, you know, I'll be able to access the internet, to have a printer that I'll have with me. Um, and of course, you know, a computer that I can use and a couple of TV screens to provide some training. Um, so that was my solution, but there aren't too many camping sites across Navajo Nation. I think um, the one that I found was in Monument Valley and then also right there by Cameron, um, just outside of Tuba City. And then uh, I know there's a place in St. Michael's, but I think they're usually full. Like they, they have, um, you know, more long-term residents there, so. I, I'm hoping to find more places to camp. Um, and then not only that, I think, um, you know, more, more safe sites for vendors and definitely more need for public restrooms. Um, you know, we all need to wash our hands and make sure that uh, we're able to do that in especially if we're on the road traveling and it's difficult to do that now that a lot of businesses are closed. So um, there's definitely a big need for that. And then of course we can never have too many food vendors. Um, I think that's one of my indulgences is <laughs> traveling to Navajo Nation and getting some, um, some good native food. But um, yeah, if, no one has anything to add. I'm going to. Vanessa, we have a couple of uh, comments on chat. Uh huh. The first one is from Jacqueline. She says, No small business here, just an interesting topic I want to listen in on. There's Geraldine. Um, she would like, she's interested in starting a tailoring or sewing business on the Nat Foundation. I think those are all good comments. And Very Geraldine, good. kudos to you. Yes, I um, have been trying to make more use of my sewing machine. I started making some Asana skirts and eventually I'd like to make some bibs for our elderly, you know, some of them with uh, Parkinson's disease um, or any type of um, disabilities might, might need that. So Raquel. Yep, I'm glad you joined us, Raquel. Thank you for being here. And I, I really admire the work that you do. I see you on social media all the time. <laughs> and Geraldine, I've seen you a few times on social media as well. So I'm glad that you were both able to participate. Thank you, Thank you Vanessa. Thank you for everything that you have impart, imparted to us. And also I'd like to thank uh, the people that attended this session, you know, some of them had to jump off because they have other things. But the session is recorded. If you would like to uh, view it again, it would be on our Change Lives YouTube channel. So you're welcome to check that out. And our next uh, webinar is going to be in June. I believe it's going to be the first. Uh, I believe the presenter there would be Mike Sixkiller. So just um, as a follow-up, I'd like to say thank you, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye, everyone.